Oh, um, so these are, um, this is a very thrush. I'll play a little bit of it in a second. This bird uses a lot of harmonics. In other words, it doesn't make a pure, a pure tone. It makes a tone, and then there's all these other tones kind of above it that give it a sort of substance. Extremely hard to hear. I mean, see, they're in dense forests, and this kind of sound actually, they're kind of like ventriloquists. So, we're first going to look at neuroanatomy of song a little bit, and then the next thing we do will be um, chapter 12, which is kind of on neurons and um, the kind of neural stuff behind animal behavior. And, you know, gender differences, all these different things. Ultimate causes. Okay. Um, okay. So, obviously, I'm not sure exactly what the RA does, but... But there are songbirds and a few other um, taxa that can do that. Um, there's these different uh, nuclei that are kind of pathways where um, the song is actually produced. Um, and then the syrinx, of course, is actually right here. In other words, goes signals down here. So the syrinx is a, is a structure that it's not, it's kind of like our voice box, but it's much, much more uh, complex than that, and much more capable of producing all sorts of different sounds, depending on the species. So here's the tracheal rings, um, the medial tympanic membrane, And um, you can look at this on your own to get a general thing, uh, idea of what's going on. So, uh, let's see, where's some nuclei? Mm. Oh, Iman, okay. So, there's all these um, obviously pathways that are going on in terms of processing and making song happen. And then there's other parts, of course, song learning, which is, which is obviously huge. If you're a songbird, you have to learn how to make the right song. And um, if you're a male, obviously, if you can't, song is usually an honest signal. And if you're a female, you have to be able to recognize that's the song you want to pay attention to. Okay, so as I said, you'd expect since the male zebra finch actually is a singer, um, and the RA is kind of essential for song production, um, that his is bigger than hers. Now, there are some species where the female and the male both sing equally as much, and under those circumstances, you would predict that the RA and all the other neural apparatus would be somewhat equivalent. Mm. Okay. Um, here's cardinal syrinx during singing. Um, Show it to you on the screen. Um, it's a nice little x ray of it. <clears throat> Hermit thrush. Um, uh, 
Let's see, where is it? Can hear that. Thrushes are known for their um, beautiful, different, beautiful songs. <clears throat> so the difference is uh, between the sexes. Um, first of all, I talked a little bit about the heterogametic sex. <laughs> And um, unlike mammals, um, birds, um, the heterogametic sex of the females, in other words, in mammals, females are XX, males are XY, and there's something called the Haldane's rule, <clears throat> where um, males are more likely to show um, deleterious genetic mutations because if there's a uh, mutation on the X chromosome, there isn't a corresponding X with males, there's just a Y that can't rescue it. And so for the most part, um, like reproductive isolating mechanisms, post-reproductive isolating mechanisms, um, a lot of times it's... Um, male inviability or sterility, um, sometimes you can get actually a female that, you know, is, um, is not sterile. Like um, uh, horses and donkeys mating and mules, depending on who's the mother and who's the father, in terms of the mule or the horse, um, the females are sometimes viable and, and uh, fertile, but the males are never. So, anyway, and in birds, it's the uh, the females that are ZW different. And so, if there's a problem on the Z chromosome, and it's the and it's on the W, there's no rescue effect. So you can actually see in let's see. In this uh, graph, um, at around 10 days, a lot of birds, uh, that's the beginning of a critical period that often in the songbird stretches from 10 to 50 days, but it's variable depending on the species. When birds are in fact primed uh, to learn song, either the males learning to sing it or the females learning to recognize male song for when they're breeding later on. And um, here you can see days after hatching, um, there's an area for songbirds and, and males is much larger and it obviously develops much larger. And this all, in, all involves um, hormones um, being produced. And so they're produced differently in males and females. Right here, um, this is where hormonal influ influences during um, early development show some markedly different market differences between young males and young females. So, um, estrogen. Now, just so you know, estrogen and testosterone. Of course, they're associated one with females, one with males, but oftentimes males and females are also exposed to the other sex hormone. I mean, just think about um, the um, spotted hyenas with a pseudo penis. The females are dominant over the males, and in fact, they get flooded with testosterone, um, and they start developing these male sexual characteristics even though they're actually female. 
pseudopenis, pseudoscrotum, all that kind of stuff. Well, now I'm, when estrogen is actually implanted in newly hatched males, and female zebra finches, there's really no effect on males, but females develop larger lung areas of the brain. Normal female, normal male, and then estrogen shade treated female. So, now, effects of testosterone vary depending on, obviously, there's elevated levels of testosterone for adult males. Um, females treated with estrogen when they're young do not sing as adults unless they receive testosterone implants, and then they do. And then females not treated with estrogen when young do not sing as adults, even if administered with testosterone implants. The females treated with estrogen as adults do not develop larger song areas of the brain. There appears to be a critical period around the time of hatching when the brain is um, sensitive to hormonal influences. As I showed earlier. Okay. <clears throat> Now, song nuclei in the brains of adult birds do change seasonally. They're obviously larger in spring, and in fact, there's a lot of different things that happen seasonally. For example, during the non-breeding season, a male's testes size is smaller, female ovary size is smaller, the song nuclei in males are smaller when not breeding than when breeding, and these effects are mediated by environmental cues such as day length, um, temperature, um, finding mates, and all that kind of stuff that would actually um, have changes like that. So photo period, as I just mentioned, directly affects this variation. Birds switch from short to long days develop larger song nuclei. And then of course the amount of testosterone also affects the size. So song learning um, I found only in a number of different uh, groups of birds. Uh, the songbirds are passerines right here. A few, some non, non passerines like parrots and hummingbirds. Um, but even um, in Learn Song, there's a strong environment, a gene by environment interaction. In other words, there are innate aspects as well as learned aspects just like in human language. So, with birds, there's usually songbirds, there's a species-specific template, in other words, kind of a template on what the sound, the song is, and then they have to be, then they have to be, the birds have to be exposed to the song in a critical period, let's say from at day 10 or 12 or whatever, like hearing their father sing, or hearing um, a recording, and that gets kind of crystallized with a male practicing over and over and over again onto the template until it's a perfect song. Now, there's a lot of birds, oh, and if, if these birds are, let's say, raised in isolation, but they don't hear song during the critical period, they never do. We're going to sing it properly. Um, 
the songs of all other birds, of course, are, well, many are inherited. They don't have to hear song. They just naturally make the sounds they make. They have two different learning types. Um, Age-limited or critical period song learners. These are often birds with a fixed repertoire, so they sing the same song over and over and over again. They um, have a restricted period of learning that occurs during the first weeks or months of life. And um, that's when they learn it. Now, I have to say, though, white crown song sparrows or white, cr white crowned um, sparrows um, actually show learning to kind of con called open ended learners. At times, so some populations of white crowns are they don't know, they don't move, they they sing the same dialect, no matter where where they are that area specific dialect. And then there's other populations that move that migrate, and they actually can learn a new region's regional dialect when they get there. The critical period is very great from one species to another and within species. So, okay. So here we are, um, day one to day 100 along the x axis, and we have a critical period. The males are in blue. At the start of the critical period, they're listening to their father sing. It's so overlaid onto the template. They start singing what's called subsong, where they practice it, get better, better and better and better. Um, and then the end of the critical period, right there, let's say, they keep singing and practicing until the breeding season starts the next year around. Females also have to listen to their father sing, and they do. Um, but they're not making song, but they have to recognize good song. And presumably, since Pop is breeding, he's a good father, um, and it's a good, so good enough song that females respond to it. Hmm. Let's see, let me go back here. Hold on. Uh, No, we're on species that learn song, maybe classified into two types. Okay. Or that. So, um, now, song learning is one of those um, things where it's both innate and learned. So, there's an innate part, namely, um, there's kind of a song template for each species. And... So, in other words, the birds are more likely to inherently to kind of sing that kind of a song. And then there's a critical period. In other words, they have to be exposed at a certain time. And if they're not, normal song development doesn't take place. So, um, if a young bird develop, birds develop in isolation, abnormal song. If a young bird is deaf, it's abnormal Birds deafened after it learned the song, it will still be able to sing normally. Young birds have to hear tutors, usually the adult males, their fathers, and they have to hear themselves singing against the backdrop of that kind of the father and the template. Let's see, did I, uh, hold on one second. Okay, so um, I'm going to play a uh, normal uh, white crown sparrow, and then uh, I, and then one that's been isolated, and you can you can tell um, what it sounds like. So let's see here. No. 
No! Stop that! Hmm. Okay, now this is what it sounds like for a bird that's been isolated. It's very simple and not right. Okay. So, so that's, that's not right. You're saying. Yeah. Okay. So, so the first one. That's much better, isn't it? Okay. So, sorry about that. So, anyway, this was normal and white crown sparrows. Uh, the first one was normal. Um, if you go to the Moodle site, you can listen to it. The other one was a bird that was isolated, um, and so wasn't exposed to white, cr white crown sparrow song. Okay, so there's these uh, different phases of development that that generally happen. Um, there's an acquisition phase where the song is learned first by listening to it from a male bird, usually their father. Um, and then the bird matches songs in the neighborhood to its own template. So if you actually uh, um, put a bird, let's say, uh, and it only listens to, um, let's say, a song sparrow instead of a white crown sparrow, um, it does try to sing a song sparrow, but it doesn't really do it very well. And then, um, but anyway, in the acquisition phase, then it begins to refine the template. So, singing over and over, like learning a language, or learning how to speak, training yourself over and over and over again. And then there's a, the song then is kind of remained, uh, retained in memory. Um, so, there's kind of a retrieval and production. Birds start producing their own songs and matching their songs to the template. So they actually sing what's called a sub-song. So it's not a full-blown adult song. Um, and then uh, feedback of vocalizations to template, which is, that's the plastic song. So it's going to be changing. It's in a critical period. and. Because it's plastic, it means that it can change. And it gets refined and refined and refined and refined until the bird is actually singing a proper adult song. And then finally, there's um, this crystallization phase, um, which is the final adult song. Okay, and this is kind of a schematic of it. So here's the uh, template. Uh, there's physiological factors, in other words, um, uh, time period, usually uh, daylight length, because this will be the start, well, this will be in the breeding season. Um, there's a sensitive period, the auditory experience, in other words, they're listening to it. The modified, the template is modified by experience. It acquires this auditory template. Um, that starts changing, and then testosterone, vocalization, feedback from vocalizations, in other words, listening, singing, listening to oneself, singing, and then song is finally matched to the template. So that's the general structure of things. Oh, uh, okay, so usually there's a critical period from about oh, 10 or 12 days to 50. But it varies by species, and it can even vary, vary by individuals. Okay, so these are young birds. In other words, if they don't learn song by, let's say, age 50, they will never sing it properly. 
kind of what happens with humans. Um, you know, they've done these things. They've found, uh, I guess, kids who were locked in the basement. They never heard talking, and they really never learned how to talk properly. So that's what it is. What if it's before 10? What? What if it's before 10? Does it have an impact on that um, I I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. But I know that usually there's a specific time period that, that's kind of the critical period. Oh. Um, okay. Let me see. Um, so, here's a song sparrow, here's a white crown sparrow. Um, let me see something. Okay. Okay, now, let's see here. Oh, that's that again. Okay, so this is normal song. This is isolation song. And then go on. Okay. So um So that's the same white crown sparrow, and here's, okay, that's good, stop that. I don't see the difference, but. No, 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 it's not happening yet, hold on. Um, Come on. 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 Come on.
whether it's Essen or Western. Okay, I give up. So, um, sorry, I can't get to work. Um, anyway, what happens is when this bird is raised um, with a song sparrow song, so this is what it actually sounds like. This is what the, um, the sonogram looks like for a song sparrow. Here it is for a white crown. Um, you've been hearing white crown. There's this neural template, where, which is kind of the open period where they can learn. Um, and then songs develop plastic and full song and um, the matching phase. And so what it actually does is it kind of incorporates um, over its own template what it's been hearing. So it's not actually producing the right kind of song. So a lot of the work was, this has been going on for a long time. Um, this guy Thorpe, he was a British fellow, uh, he uh, was raised, uh, raising chaffinches, um, probably in, I guess he was probably in uh, uh, England or maybe Germany, I don't know. And, um, and he had these chambers where they could not hear the song of their parents, and he found that they could produce only a rough song. So that's the kind of an innate template. Um, he also showed, of course, that there was the sensitive period. Um, so after these birds were kept in isolation, um, uh, they were exposed to the songs of chaffinches and other species of finches. He found these birds could learn songs for the first 13 months of life, but not after. Furthermore, naive birds would selectively sing chaffinch songs rather than the songs of other species. He has a question. <laughs> no. So what? Was, does that relate to, you know, like, if, if a kid learns a language when they're young, mm -hmm. and uh, they won't have an accent, but when they learn a language... What do you mean they won't have an accent? Like, uh, kids who, like, like know Spanish, and, like, let's say they learn English when they're three, yeah. and then they learn Spanish when they're five, mm -hmm. and they learn Japanese when they're seven, yeah. they're not going to have an accent. They're not going to have, like, a... They're going to have an accent of, the, of what, they, what they hear. Like, if they're hearing, Br hearing British English... They're going to hear, they're going to have British accent, right? But, but past a certain age, like let's say I were to learn Spanish right now, yeah. I have like a, a terrible accent. Right. But but if I learned Spanish when I was like six, seven, I yeah. wouldn't have an accent in Spanish. No. You, well, you would, but it wouldn't be like, first of all. It would be a regal accent. Yeah. We, we um, okay, so in terms of language, uh, little kids, especially really young kids, um, can learn a whole bunch of languages all at once. They don't have any trouble figuring out, you know, mixing things up or anything like that. Um, and then over time, um, if they keep lear learning all those languages, it'll, those languages will finally be kind of there for them. Doesn't mean they don't keep learning new words and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's why when you bring, like, um, you have a kid and you go to another country, they usually pick up the new language right away while you look like a doofus, mm -hmm. right? Now, there are, I will say that there's individual variation. Um, I know some adults who are just playing amazing at learning new languages. It's like nothing's really changed for them. Um, I knew this guy, oh, he speaks like 14 different languages. And it just makes sense to him. When he hears a new language, it just makes sense. And he starts putting things together, and within a month, he's speaking. So, but that's not the most, most of us. Most of us, is a, it's a grind. So, but in the same way, um, songs are learned in the sensitive phase. There's also dialects that we'll get to. Um, but different populations of birds will often sing 
a uh, different dialect. And we'll hear that in a little tiny bit. Let's see here. Okay, so um, in white crowns, um, there was a sensitive period between 10 and 50 days for these kinds of birds. Other birds are slightly different, but early on in their lives. Um, after 50 days, um, learning could still, be, still take place in about 70% of the birds um, if, the, if a live bird was used as the um, father, right? Um, the idea of social stimulation is important. Um, live birds are important. In other words, they often interact with a live bird where just a recording is not the same thing. So, and this is especially important, um, social environments in birds are really, um, well, like a lot of different species, they're really, they're, they're huge. Um, and in certain social situations, um, you learn certain things like, uh, I think there was something, we'll get to it probably with um, um, brown-headed cowbirds, but the females, if they, if they don't hear the right thing, and then they don't respond, and so the males actually have to learn how the females like it. Okay. <coughs> Oh, so white crowned sparrows exposed to live tutors, in other words, live birds, um, extend their critical period beyond, basically beyond 50 days. Um, and this work was done by uh, Luis Baptista and Petronovic. Um, uh, Luis could, um, he could actually sing, whistle, all these different dialects of white crowned sparrows. He just had one of those minds where it, he, it's kind of like he could mimic. Um, he died, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, but he was amazing. He was from Macau, and he was just uh, incredible in terms of, of his natural ear for, for birdsong. So, one of the advantages, I guess, of, of um, having a sensitive period um, is that there's a premium on age of first breeding. So, in other words, you better learn the song early because then you'll be ready to breed, otherwise you'll get left out of the, the fun. So, age of first breeding, um, and, a, and, and they're usually found in a harsh desert environment. There's a sensitive phase that ends at 14 weeks, and that's pretty much it. Now, um, there's also, so this is, the one before was they have a certain period of time to learn the song, and then that's it. The song is crystallized, it doesn't change. Now, there are some birds that... Um, have open-ended learning. They can continue to um, update their songs. Uh, this is especially important if they end up traveling and encountering birds that sing a different dialect. Okay, so um, they learn from new neighbors, aids in male-male competition, so they learn new songs throughout their life, and of course they learn the correct song for the population that they, let's say, meet in terms of what the female likes. So there can be quite a bit of variation in the actual dialects that they're singing. So, um, let me see if I can get that to go.
Okay, so that's a that's a brown headed cowbird. That was a bird. And um, these guys are brood parasites. In other words, they come in, they lay their own eggs in someone else's nest. They get the other birds to actually raise their brood instead of putting in all the effort. And usually their their own um, offspring grow quick more quickly than the host. Um, so. Now, you have to remember, brown-headed cowbirds, they don't um, ever hear their, so their father sing, right? They're only hearing their adoptive parents sing. So they actually have um, um, a, de a delayed song learning period uh, where they finally encounter what a normal um, cowbird song sounds like. Um, and so when, like in, in yearlings, it's just pretty poorly developed, but it gets better and better over time. So, male cowbirds um, that have never heard other cowbird songs produce correct soundbird, a cowbird song. In other words, it's kind of an innate thing they can do natural song because they're not really going to learn it from their, their, their father. Um, now, the songs of cowbirds are shaped by male-male interactions and by female responses to the song. And so isolated as males sing more potent songs than young males raised in social setting. Why? Um, so let's see, males that do not have visual or direct contact with dominant males produce more potent song than do males. Okay, then young males learn to modify their songs to avoid, oh, attack. Okay, that's right. So, if um, in a social setting, they don't sing young birds at the top of their lungs because that is likely to induce an attack from a more mature male. So, they sing, but they don't sing like they would if they were all by themselves, where they're just singing out. They modify it depending on um, who's around them at that time. So, uh, let's see, percentage of songs that release the copulatory oh, posture of females, okay, um, auditory and vis visual isolation. Visual, so rearing condition of males with respect to male conspecifics. Okay, visual isolation, visual contact, direct contact. So I guess they, um, they need auditory and visual isolation. I'm not sure what that means. Then young, oh, okay. Well, on we go. Sorry, what they were doing. Oh, oh. So, um, female um, influence. Male cowbirds modify their song in response to female display of a wing stroke. So the females do this little display. Um, the females only display the wing stroke stroke uh, discriminately, only to some males and not to others. And males change their songs. To, solic to solicit a female's display. So, if she doesn't get the right song, then she's not going to give the wing flick, and um, the poor male is going to be, you know, feeling like left out. But if he then starts producing a variation on that song, and he perhaps gets it right, then the female actually will give him the wing stroke and uh, the wing flick, flick. And, um, and then perhaps copulate with them. Okay, so let's see here. Yeah. Um, here's, now the, like I mentioned earlier, um, there aren't very many birds. There's um, songbirds, which are the passerines that learn songs and have, you know, a highly varied song. Um, and then there's also um, hummingbirds, 
um, sing a song, uh, like songbirds do, and then parrots also do the same sort of thing. Now, um, let's see, vocal non-learners, in other words, they're born with it, and then learners, they're actually, they learn what their proper song or call is. Um, they've looked at um, the brains of all these different species, they're somewhat different, um, but still using some of the same structures. So parrots and um, passerine songbirds have uh, much more in common in terms of the, the, nu the song nuclei in their brains. So, obviously, song is for who, in general? The woman. Female. 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 And who else? So, uh, males? Yeah. So, other males. Um, a lot of birds actually establish territories with their songs. And so, instead of hearing a territory holder over there and responding with a big attack, what they do is they get used to it. Oh, that's Harold over there. I don't have to go and attack him. He's got his territory. I've got mine. Um, maybe his, his, uh, his wife will come over for a little couple of extra pair of copulations. Who knows, right? So, now, a male could fine-tune his song in terms of the transmission characteristics. Let's say they live in um, slightly different habitats, and certain habitats, let's say you've got a forest habitat, you have a bird that's found widely, and uh, in some places there's a forest habitat, in others there's an open woodland. Song carries in those situations differently. And so it's been shown that young males can actually um, change the way their song is depending on what habitat they're in. Of course, there's territorial defense. And then um, song learning may have evolved as a means of what transferring complex patterns of behavior from one generation to the next. This hypothesis predicts that more information can be stored in memory than in genes, uh, especially in terms of how to respond properly um, in a social context. Um, it also may... Um, there's this idea that it's a, a, a mechanism to identify um, your species, and not only that, but the population from which you belong. So, now, there's song dialects. Not all birds sing different dialects. Um, Open-ended learners are more likely to sing dialects than others. Uh, and they're similar to language dialects. So let's think about this. Um, what do dialects have to do with, um, with uh, let's say, language dialects with people you meet? Does that, does that affect the way you deal with them? Yeah. Right, so how does it affect? Like if I can't understand them? Yeah. Then I just try not to talk to them. Right, yeah. Like, I, for example, I have a mechanic that has like a very thick Vietnamese accent. Uh huh. I'm, you know, and I just can't understand them, so I ask other people to talk to them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, we just agree with him, right? Talk to him. I trust them, though. Talk to him in English or talk to him in Vietnamese. Yeah. I don't know what it means, though. So, um, first of all, if you notice, you notice people who are not talking the, let's say, regional dialect, right? Um, we have an, an idea of what songs, I mean, uh, words, uh, language in the United States, it sounds like, mm -hmm. um, and there are certainly regional dialects. Um, how do you, how does anybody respond to, let's say, um, Southerners? There's a cultural bias. Yeah, there is. Ex 
exactly. Kind of like, uh, we're local and you're not. Now remember, this, we're in a different situation now. We live in a situation where we likely come into contact with strangers a lot more often than in the past. Um, but in the past, it was the, the dialect or the way you spoke kind of signaled, oh, he's an insider like us versus an outsider like them. Now, of course, in terms of different languages, it goes even further. So the in-group can speak the language, and the out-group can't. Um, now, it'd be nice if we all spoke, you know, we could understand the different languages, but evolution has actually shaped this in terms of the local group that you can kind of rely on and the other group that you might encounter that might be dangerous or different. So, the same thing happens with song dialects. And just like in human dialects, uh, this variation governs basically social interactions. So, you hear someone with um, a, a deep down twang, like that, you might say, well, he's a hazy. Right? Can you repeat that? I didn't yeah. hear that. What? <laughs> I didn't hear that. Can you repeat that? I said, if he's got a deep down twang like this, okay? Uh, you might understand, well, not understand, but you know, you might think of him as a hazy. Hey, hazy! Right? Okay. So you talk like that. I'm just going to ask Andrea, I bet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hazy! Okay. Again? 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 Hazy! Okay. So, um, maybe everybody should try their own. So, no, we can't. That's really, that's really mean, isn't it? It is. I'm sorry. Anybody in here is from the South? I used to live in Atlanta, but not originally from Atlanta. Yeah. No, you don't look like a southern girl. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't either. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think right now that's where we're going to stop so that I can meet with people who are actually doing topics instead of doing a, a field project. Okay? So, um, get with your groups, and then I'll come around and talk to you. And then there's, let's see if I can, uh, mm.